Welcome to the 5,517th meeting of the Rotary Club of Chicago, the world's oldest service club. I like to start our meetings with a Rotary moment. And today we are going to feature the club of Hornsey, uh, Hornsey, excuse me, I misspoke, in East Riding, East Yorkshire, uh, the UK. Uh, we have uh, from that club, uh, and here you have a picture of the promenade in, in Hornsey, an East Riding Rotary Club. Uh, I've learned today that East Riding appears to be a county uh, in Yorkshire, but with us today is Dennis Bell, uh, who is going to share the four-way test with us at the end of the meeting, uh, but I wanted to introduce him and highlight his club. Uh, Dennis was the president of the club in 2006 and 2007. Uh, Hornsey, Hornsey is one of the uh, more uh, one of the younger uh, Rotary clubs, but they've been very active, particularly uh, with helping uh, the youth in their community. So, welcome, Dennis, and uh, um, uh, we will uh, we will hear from you uh, later in the meeting. Uh, the thought for the day will be shared uh, with us by our member Nita. Nita, uh, could you unmute yourself and proceed? Okay, thank you, Marshall. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, today's thought of the day is associated with the concept of flow. If you've ever heard of the term phrase, go with the flow, it's by um, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi uh, from the book he wrote, Flow, the Psychology of Optimal Experience. He was also um, my college professor at University of Chicago. So here's the quote. Contrary to what we usually believe, moments like these the best moments in our lives are not the passive, receptive, relaxing times, although such experiences can also be enjoyable if we have worked hard to attain them. The best moments usually occur when a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. Optimal experience is thus something that we make happen. For a child, it could be placing with trembling fingers the last block on a tower she has built, higher than any she has built so far. For a swimmer, it could be trying to beat his own record. For a violinist, mastering an intricate musical passage. For each person, there are thousands of opportunities, challenges to expand ourselves. So I thought that was fitting with um, I think what we're all going through, different things and different flows. So, and also with our um, focus on service. Thank you. Yes, Nita, thank you very much. It's uh, given the challenging times, I think it's difficult uh, for us to find our flow, but as we're existing in this time more and more, I think uh, people are learning uh, ways, to, uh, ways to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, so today we have a, a, a different kind of program. Uh, <clears throat> joining us from uh, from the Adler Planetarium is uh, Laura Truly, who whom I met uh, at a district presentation uh, early on in the in the pandemic, um, and she's going to uh, talk to us about something that I had discovered actually years ago, and uh, offers a great opportunity for uh, for all of us and our children and our grandchildren. To uh, uh, to learn in, in a very a very interesting and, and unique way, um, we're going to entertain questions uh, during and after the presentation. So if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat box. When Laura's done, uh, we will um, uh, entertain questions, and people will be able to unmute. But um, during the presentation, if you have a question, if you could just put it in the um, uh, put it in the chat box. Um, that would be uh, that would be very helpful. So it's my great pleasure to uh, to introduce uh, Laura Truly, and I probably am mispronouncing her name, but I'm sure she'll correct me. Um, she's been leading the Adler's uh, citizen uh, science efforts since June of 2015. Before that, uh, she had a joint position with Northwestern University and the Adler. Uh, uh, in astronomy, as an observational astronomer, she uh, she researched supermassive black holes, which are uh, increasingly in the uh, in the headlines these days. And maybe she'll share with us uh, what uh, 
a little bit of what she learned in that regard. Um, she earned her bachelor's degree summa cum laude from Dartmouth and uh, her PhD in astronomy from uh, our neighbor to the north, the University of Wisconsin. Uh, so Laura, uh, you have the floor. Wonderful. I really appreciate the chance to speak with you all. Since I couldn't join you actually from the Adler Planetarium, I thought I'd choose the next best thing. <laughs> um, one of the fun things of Zoom is the virtual backgrounds. Um, so uh, over the course of the next 25 minutes or so, I, I thought I'd share some of about Zooniverse and also generally just the ways the Adler engages the public in real research. So this effort of citizen science. Um, that's what I have the pleasure of leading um, at our institution. Um, and also, before I sort of dove into that, I thought I'd just share a little bit about the Rotary's special particular meaning to, to me and my family. Uh, so my, my father's French, uh, he's one of seven kids, a good Catholic French family, and um, grew up on a, a tiny farm in the northern part of France and was lucky enough to get a Rotary scholarship to continue his engineering studies um, here in Chicago. And it was through the Evanston Rotary Club um, or just the Rotary of this uh, region that he was able to do that. And so I'm actually not on the space station, but uh, in a house in Evanston, in the house my mother grew up in, in Evanston. And so, um, so it was sort of Rotary that actually made me possible. So thank you, thank you to all. Um, and also just for all the, all the good work and support of, of young people that you do, um, which will be part of what I talk about in this talk. So I'm gonna share my screen and, um, and definitely don't hesitate to post questions, ask questions. Um, throughout. Um, so now first, uh, ha has the screen loaded and are you able to see? Um, excellent. So there's the Adler in this beautiful spot um, in museum campus in downtown Chicago. Um, and we have behind that building is a telescope. So if you do want to look up at the night sky once we are past this period of um, physical distancing, uh, come, come check out the museum and check out that telescope um, and observatory. Um, so the first part of this talk uh, is going to focus on, let me just make this smaller, um, it's going to focus on the Zooniverse element of our efforts. So Zooniverse is the world's largest platform for online citizen science. Um, we started a decade ago, a partnership between the University of Oxford and the Adler Planetarium, and that was because the Adler is an expert in engaging the public in science, and the Oxford is an expert in data and research and has a reputation in that um, community. And so together we were able to engage the public in meaningful ways in real research. We've now grown to over hundred projects. I'll share what types of projects there are. Um, Two million people around the world participating and um, uh, five million classifications contributed weekly by that community. Um, so people are doing everything from discovering planets around distant stars to tagging animals in wildlife um, camera trap images across the Serengeti Desert to um, transcribing handwritten historical documents. I'll share some of that and how you can participate. Um, so for the next few minutes, you could just go to zooniverse.org slash projects and go find a project and uh, and maybe listen with one ear, but go and participate. But I'll, I'll walk through a few of the different ones. Um, to give a sense for what this is and why, what was the motivation for starting Zooniverse? Back in 2007, there was a small group of astronomers who had a million galaxy data set. And in order to do their research, all they needed to know first was, is that a spiral galaxy or is that an elliptical galaxy? And at the time, and still today, machine learning automated algorithms fail at this task in interesting and complicated ways. And so they're not reliable, but human eyes are excellent at this. And so they set their grad students to work and one grad student classified 50,000 galaxies in a month, um, but that was only a drop in the bucket of the million galaxy data set. And they quickly did the calculation and realized it would be more than their professional lifetimes to just classify the galaxies, let alone dig into their research of interest of how galaxies change over time. And my background is in studying black holes and galaxy evolution and that interplay. And so it's a fascinating data set that just needed to be unlocked. At the time, Angry Birds was quite popular. People were spending 
many years collectively every day uh, playing on Angry Birds. So the research team wondered, could we harness the power of the crowd to help us with this data and this research? Um, and the Adler Planetarium was a partner in that galaxy um, research team. And they thought, well, let's see if we can do this with the public, if we do it thoughtfully. So they launched the Galaxy Zoo project. In the first hours, they were getting 50,000 classifications an hour. Over the course of the first year, over 200,000 people participated from all around the world. Um, and they classified the whole data set through millions of classifications. And the project has since led to over 45 peer reviewed publications and a major impact on the field of research. So soon other research teams um, heard about this new approach to crowdsourcing research and that you could get reliable and valid data from it. So then uh, one of the next research teams was a group of researchers at the University of Minnesota uh, from the Lyon Research Center who had millions of images from across the Serengeti Desert. And so they created with uh, the Zooniverse web development team, um, Snapshot Serengeti. In that first weekend of launch, they got 3 million classifications and processed a backlog of 18 months of data. So this was sort of the second proof of concept that you could really um, quickly classify or categorize data with five-year-olds to 95-year-olds participating. Um, part of the way we um, can make sure that we have reliable quality data is that every image is looked at by multiple people. So in Galaxy Zoo, it was 45 people classified every image. In Snapshot Serengeti, it's 25 people classify every image. And when you compared, when the team compared about a thousand images that had been classified by experts with the same thousand images classified by the crowd of 25, they found that 97% of the time, the crowd agreed with the experts. Um, and in the 3% when they didn't, about half the time, it was because the, um, about half the time, even the experts didn't agree amongst themselves because it was probably an animal way off in the distance where you can only see the tail. And so who knew if it was a wildebeest or a zebra. Um, but, uh, but that was, and through the peer reviewed publications from these projects, we were able to establish the reliability and the quality of the crowdsourced results from this online community of participants. So we have then expanded not just from astronomy projects or ecology projects, but the same model we've applied to text transcription of historical documents. Um, so here's an example from our anti-slavery manuscripts project, which is really a lovely data set of William Lloyd Garrison and his network of abolitionists and the letters they wrote to one another. And sometimes it was you know, specifically about their, their efforts in the cause. And sometimes it's just personal details or things that, they're, that are on their mind of the everyday life of that time. Um, and so in this type of project, three people classify every, or transcribe, I should say, transcribe every line. And then, um, and then the, the researchers use those data and understand um, uh, the result and then make that discoverable or searchable by the, the public community. It's a partnership we have with the Boston Public Library. We've also applied the same model of crowdsourced research to uh, disaster relief. So here, um, when the hurricane swept through the Caribbean recently, we, um, we quickly uploaded satellite imagery of pre and post images. And in partnership with Rescue Global, a humanitarian aid organization um, that works on the ground with people, we, um, well, with 10,000 Zooniverse participants who tagged these images with road blockages and floods and other um, features of interest for Rescue Global, they then could very efficiently allocate resources to the areas of the islands that needed the help or the areas of the islands that were actually um, less impacted and, and um, uh, in a better situation. So um, with each earthquake or hurricane that occurs, we turn this project on and our community responds in amazing ways in terms of quickly providing the data that's needed. Um, a feature of every project and part of the reason people 
really stay involved in the long term is that every project has a dedicated discussion forum. So the Galaxy Zoo project has Galaxy Zoo Talk, which we call the discussion forums, and thousands of people post questions about the data they've seen, something unusual, what they want to know about the science, or just generally about their interests. And the commitment that the research team makes is that when they upload their data to these universe projects, they commit to being very present and responsive in the discussion forums, because it's so important, especially right now, that there's as, as many bridges and communication avenues between scientists and the public and breaking down those barriers between who can talk about science, who can participate in science, who can participate meaningfully in these efforts. Um, it's been really um, heartwarming, especially, you know, it always has been, but especially these past six weeks, the types of comments and support that the, these communities are providing to one another. Um, and so the other uh, element that comes out of those discussion forums is that weird objects, the rare and the unusual can be flagged by our, uh, our volunteers and, and brought to the attention of the research team. So this image is of a beautiful galaxy. And so the typical Galaxy Zoo project, you would just you know, say, oh, that's a, that's a, a galaxy with features and, um, and then go through the process. But what's unusual here is this green blob. And this turns out after follow-up um, observing with the Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes, um, the researchers and the participants who discovered this unusual object were able to realize it was a ghost remnant of a supermassive black hole outflow. So in the center of this galaxy is a monstrous black hole that is interacting with its surroundings and sometimes burps or belches <laughs> and, and throws out material to the surrounding and shocks with the surrounding intergalactic medium. And this is a very unusual object to have found. Only a dozen others have been found to date in millions of images of galaxies we've taken. And that gives us a sense for the timelines of super black, massive black hole activity. Um, and so, oh, there's a chat. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so uh, this is just one example of how when you have so many eyes on the data, you can find the unusual and the rare and it's also one of the reasons that even as we integrate more machine learning and automated routines into the Zooniverse human machine system, we always wanna keep opportunities for human eyes because a machine would never have been able to catch such a rare and unusual object because there's no way it would have been trained up to look for it. So again, you're welcome to go to zooniverse.org slash projects check out the hundred um, active projects that are there. Here's a screenshot of the, what the page looks like. You can filter by different disciplines. So say you're a space nut, like I am. You can go and check out the currently 20 active astronomy related projects from looking at the surface of Mars to, um, uh, oh, really interesting transcription historical project around early women astronomers to um, looking for muons and higher energy particles. Um, you could also click on medicine to participate in our biomedical projects and help that community. The literature, uh, historical transcription and tagging metadata projects and, and many more. In ecology alone right now, I think there's 35 different projects for looking at animals. Um, so uh, it gives a sense for the breadth and type of projects available on Zooniverse. Um, the other nice element that we've provided is that um, if you sign in, so you can participate without registering. Um, it, we didn't want to cause any barrier to entry, but if you do register, you can then keep track of how many classifications you've done. And so I've done like 1300 classifications to date. And for each project I've participated in, I can see how many classifications I've contributed. It's just, uh, it's nice to see the impact that you're having directly. I also wanted to note that um, we've partnered with educators from around the country and the world to create um, lesson plans and curricular materials for young learners, for kindergarten classrooms, middle school classrooms, high school classrooms, and also a whole focus on um, undergrad non-STEM major uh, curricular experiences. So if you go to classroom.zooniverse.org, you can retrieve some of those materials or best is to go to our blog um, 
blog.zooniverse.org. And we recently posted uh, a piece that provides links to over 25 different ways to engage with Zooniverse projects as a student. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that. And then I also wanted to note that we, through a National Science Foundation grant this uh, about now two years ago, we were able to build a museum based experience uh, or a museum experience experience based around Zooniverse. Um, we chose Galaxy Zoo as the first project to do with this with and you can see um, the kid is celebrating because he he's been told he was he was right about the way he classified a particular galaxy and and the mom and the daughter are figuring out and it's it's collaborative in that um, there's you can't quite see it in this image but there's a, a field of galaxies in the middle and you pull from that field and you classify the galaxies and you can ask the people around the table for help. Um, but we really wanted to bring this experience straight to our museum guests um, after seeing how much it resonates with our online worldwide communities. Um, I'll note that of our Zooniverse registered participants, uh, 18,000 Chicagoans are, are registered participants. So maybe you'll, you're, you'll add yourself to that today. Um, we also have a mobile app, um, about 15 of our projects are in a native mobile experience. I mean, you can access any of them through a browser in your, in your mobile phone. Um, but if you go to, um, iTunes or, uh, the Google play for iOS and Android, you can download the Zooniverse app. And it's quite fun because we, the simplest is like, projects that are yes, no, is there a scene line here or not? You swipe right for yes and left for no. We joke that we created Tinder's universe. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, a, it's, a very it's, a, it's a very helpful and efficient way to help researchers unlock their data with those simple yes, no type workflows. Um, I also, I'll admit that I find it quite calming to do it on the app and just swiping um, it's a nice uh, distraction during these difficult times, for sure. So then I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, for the next about five or 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about a different uh, Adler planetarium effort around citizen science and how we've been engaging the public in real research. So I'm going from a, the Zooniverse project in which we engage 2 million people around the world to the Aquarius project, which has been a ton of fun and has engaged over 200 Chicago area young people, mostly high school uh, students and some um, undergrads. So the, what the project is, and it's one of my favorite logos or uh, landing page images, um, but the Aquarius, Aquarius project is part of our Far Horizons teen program efforts at the Adler. And Far Horizons engages young people in engineering and design and iterative efforts and real research, um, hands-on experiences with our researchers, uh, astronomers, and engineers at the Adler and partner institutions. Um, so the impetus for the Aquarius project was two years ago, a meteorite fell into Lake Michigan. And this is a journal excerpt of, <laughs> holy crap, just saw a huge fireball out my window at one in the morning from Shane Larson, who at the time was the, an Adler planetarium astronomer is now at Northwestern. Um, but this is an image of the fireball uh, going through the sky that over 500 people saw and weather radar and other radars picked up as it fell it fell straight into Lake Michigan. And so that morning, Shane emailed our team at the Adler and said, we have to go hunting for this. And we immediately agreed and thought, well, yes, we do high altitude balloon launches with our Far Horizons program, but why not point our efforts into the lake itself? And so the Adler has always been very good at partnerships, strategic key partnerships with other um, institutions. And so we immediately reached out to Mark Fries, who's a NASA researcher. And here's a picture of a group of our teams uh, talking with Mark via uh, Zoom, like a call like this one. And, um, and this was just a, a week after the fireball had fallen and we were trying to create our plans for how to go out and retrieve meteorite fragments. And so you can see the kid in the back has raised his hand. And this is my favorite moment in the project where the kid raises his hand and says, so how does NASA go about doing this? And Mark, you can see the look on his face, which is 
we've never done this before. NASA had never done a lake retrieval of meteorite fragments. And so over the course of the next 18 months, it was a project of figuring it out together, putting the teens directly in the driver's seat of discovery, which is really at the core of what the Adler does, um, having them be experts alongside the experts and learning alongside the experts. Um, it was a very special project. Um, and so uh, through the course of those 18 months, the teens uh, created prototype uh, magnet magnetic sleds to drag behind a boat and retrieve uh, the fragments. They you know, went through the whole process of iterative design and testing and prototyping and learning and de designing again. And this was with, um, through our Far Horizons program, we engage hundreds of teens every year in all sorts of workshops and Saturday experiences and uh, partnerships with the library to engage broader groups. So it was with a really broad uh, range of people or young people. And it was in partnership with the Shed Aquarium, um, because of their, <laughs> because they have boats, uh, but also their expertise in marine biology and understanding the lake, um, and with NASA and uh, the Field Museum, who have experts with meteorites, and as well as our astronomers and engineers. Um, key, as the same as what you do with your young people that you engage through Rotary, it's about making connections. So the connections between the teens themselves with each other the connections and really deep relationships with the scientists, not only about the science, but as people and what's the trajectory for this career and what got you into it. Um, and then building the teens relationship with science. We serve particularly um, teens from under-resourced neighborhoods. And so oftentimes they, they may not have a relationship with science or a sense of any science identity. And that's part of what we're creating and providing for them, that space to build their confidence and sense that, yes, this is me too. Um, the other part was um, underlying all our programs is to fail big and in public, meaning that science is all about mistakes and learning from them, failures and understanding why, and that's part of the iterative prototyping, design, learning, revisions. Um, and so we did that very publicly through a, a blog that we held through the National Geographic so that the teens could, one, learn about science communication, but also know that that is part of science, but really part of life is failure, learning from failure, moving forward from that, um, and doing that as a team. So uh, one discovery that has come from this, other than actually, yes, we have retrieved some micrometeorite pieces from the meteorite that fell, um, was Part of this was it fell in a part of the lake that had never been mapped before fully. So the teens and the scientists provided a more detailed map of that area of the lake. And um, as they were going in the first launch, boat launch, to drag the, the magnetic sled, the marine biologist from the shed was sitting next to the teens. And as the video camera that went down with the magnetic sled um, was taking video footage, um, the marine biologist gasped and the teens looked to her and looked to the video footage and looked to her and she said, oh no, it's actually quite an unfortunate discovery is that while, so the, at that depth in the lake, we had expected that this quagga mussels, which is an invasive species, that there wouldn't be enough oxygen for them to survive. Um, we already knew that quagga mussels were in other parts of the lakes and you may have uh, more expertise in this group than I do about mussels, but um, but the going idea was that in the deeper parts of the lake, these mussels wouldn't be there. But instead, all they saw for miles and miles were these these mussels, um, and so this has prompted additional efforts and work around our lakes and invasive species in our lakes. Um, but it was an important discovery. Um, while looking for one piece of alien, <laughs> um, you know, a meteorite, we found another alien. Um, but it was really special for the teens to be there at that moment and see that moment of, of, of discovery, both the good and the bad. Um, so that was just a bit of a touch on our, our Zooniverse efforts. And uh, one, one of our programs with teens um, in the Chicago area, um, we're going to close out just by sharing that zooniverse.org slash projects link again. Um, 
people have enjoyed, um, you know, participating as a group and then say, like, at the end of the day saying, hey, I did 200 classifications today and sharing those results with one another. Um, I'm happy to help you think through how you might do group experiences or really just as individuals or with your kids at home, um, take part in Zooniverse projects and, and contribute meaningfully to, to real research and help us out. Um, the other is if you're in a company uh, that has in the past or is looking for digital engagement, corporate volunteering type opportunities, we've put together a specific proposal and have now partnered with a number of different companies um, to uh, provide impact reports to that company of how their staff have participated in Zooniverse in their volunteering hours and what that means for the, you know, the planet hunters who are discovering planets around distant stars or for the ecologists who are trying to unlock these important data sets that give insights into climate change. Um, so please email that contact at zooniverse.org if you think that your company may want to partner with the Adler and Zooniverse in that way, and I'll share that proposal with you. It's also been um, a pretty critical uh, alternate revenue stream for us as we've been closed. And so it's something that um, companies have been interested in doing both for philanthropic reasons as well as actually for their staff um, engagements. Um, the other is on the Adler mission side, as Rotary brings in young people into your programs um, into the future, now you might think about the Adler as places for them to volunteer or get engaged with. We have all sorts of adult volunteers with our teen programs um, and docent programs and other, and it's really, we truly do have space for everyone. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. Thank you from my team at the Adler, um, both, you know, on the Zooniverse side, on our team program side, and, and the broader Adler team. With that, I'll pause and welcome questions. Yeah, Lauren, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I will uh, start with the questions. I don't see any in the chat box, but if people have them, certainly they're, they're welcome. I see that we have uh, one or two uh, young guests at the meeting today. Uh, could you maybe just spend a minute or two and explain what the the best way is to introduce kids to the Zooniverse and how to go about, um, you know, setting them up in an appropriate age appropriate program uh, yes. to uh, take advantage? Definitely. Um, so what I'm going to do is go to blog.zooniverse.org, which you're welcome to do. And then if you click here on the side, there's a recent post, or it's actually even a, a flagged post of remote online learning resources. And so one thing, I mean, over the years, I've, my favorite photos are of kindergarten classrooms, like taking part in snapshotsafari.org, which is one of those universe projects. And it's, it's really truly kindergartners can do that task of identifying animals as well as 95 year olds. Um, and for many of the projects, young learners uh, give as good a data as as the as the more mature ones will say. But if you go to this blog post, um, there is a curated list of age appropriate Zooniverse projects for five to twelve year olds, um, and then also for teens and adults. Just sort of showcasing or highlighting a few from the list of currently a hundred. Um, so I, I highly recommend just going to this blog post and I can share it with your organizers and they can share that out. Um, and then there's a Zooniverse based activity for five to 12 year olds, just with um, a really simple 40 minute experience that leads you through um, uh, getting to know a project, some reflection questions along the way and just participating and, and having fun with it. Um, so that's, that's a good go to. But really, if you don't even want to go to that blog post or click on any of the links, zooniverse.org slash projects and, um, and just dive straight in. There's currently 100 active projects and, and really um, any one of them, especially if it's an adult and a parent together, um, is very feasible and interesting. Thanks for the question. So we have uh, another question from uh, our guest from Hornsey. Um, are we any closer to understanding how the universe began from nothing at the Big, big Bang? Um, in many ways, yes, we have so much information. And in many ways, um, it's going to be us and the next generation that'll keep unlocking this. Um, 
One of my favorite spots within the Adler is our walk through space and time, where it goes through what we do know in terms of hydrogen and helium in the very early universe and how over time those materials, just because of gravity, gravity pulls things together, started forming into the first stars. Um, but that took, you know, 100 million years. And, and then those first stars started putting out the heavier elements into their surroundings. And then those first stars started grouping together into actual clumps like galaxies. Um, this is a process of 14 billion years. Uh, and, and so through telescopes, um, we're able to look directly back in time. And then through our models and simulations, we're able to start getting a sense for um, just how this universe of ours has set itself up and, and really where we're headed as well. Um, one of the things I should sort of promote to this group is starting May 21st, we're gonna be moving what we used to do in person at the Adler called Astronomy Conversations and provide digital astronomy conversations. And so this community and, and your network might be really interested in joining. The first speaker will be Mark Subro actually talking about galaxies, and then we'll go into cosmology for the next week. And so I, I'll share that information with you, but the first will be May 21st at noon, and, um, and it'll be a Zoom kind of gathering like this with a live stream to Facebook for um, a larger audience to be able to follow along and post questions. Um, but that'll be a great place to ask more questions of that type. Um, we have uh, one other question. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of digest it a little because this thought occurred to me as well that the meteor hitting the lake is, is really kind of a spectacular event. And it looked like it actually became very close or came very close to inhabited areas. I mean, how common are meteors like this and how worried should we be that <laughs> We'll be watching TV and one will drop in our living room. Yes. Um, well, one, you are constantly being peppered with tiny, tiny little micrometeorite fragments. One of my favorite at-home experiments, um, and you, I think you can Google how to do it, but you can uh, troll, pull through your gutters and pull out micro, tiny micrometeorites micro from your own gutters because we're just, you know, there's all sorts of space dust and debris falling through our atmosphere. Um, the large pieces like this one, which was the size of about um, like a small car, uh, one, it breaks up as it goes through our atmosphere. So our atmosphere, the friction as it fall, falls through those particles is just very, it gets very hot, breaks up into lots of little pieces. And so the largest we expected um, to find, which would have been amazing, but we didn't, was uh, a baseball-sized piece. And then, but most of the pieces were just tiny micrometeorites. So that car-sized object that hit the outside of our upper atmosphere broke up into tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces and created a strewn field of a few miles wide uh, in the lake, a few miles off the coast. Um, uh, so, so most objects are going to break up into small pieces before they would hit, you know, a house or a roof anyways. Um, the other is there have been a few instances where, uh, you know, a basketball sized object, there's a great picture online of somebody's car that got hit by a, ba I shouldn't say great because I'm sure it was terribly distressing for the person. They weren't in it, but um, it is an extremely rare event, which is why you can Google like object hit by a meteorite and it's, it's, um, it's unusual. A few years ago, there was the Chelyabinsk uh, meteor that fell um, and that also was near a, a, an urban location. I don't know if I see some nods so people remember that in the news. Um, but it's quite rare and also importantly, any objects of that size astronomers were already tracking it and knowing um, where it was going to fall, what its location was. Um, we have a, a major asteroid and meteor tracking program um, that one of our other astronomers is actually involved in, but um, that does, uh, they, that are aware of any large objects that would be problematic and none are headed for direct hits um, and we have a whole program for monitoring that. Well, that's very comforting in these times when we're dealing with a pandemic. We don't have to worry about uh, meteorites hitting us. But Laura, thank you so much uh, for sharing today. And uh, thank you for the club for indulging my one of my 
uh, personal interests. When I'm not uh, doing rotary things, I, um, I have a very large telescope up in Michigan that I love to, to do observing with. So um, this is a subject that's very, very near and dear to my heart. But we, um, uh, Laura, give a uh, gift to our speakers uh, to thank them uh, for taking the time to uh, share their expertise. Uh, we uh, work with local community organizations and this year we commissioned uh, an organization called Ignite, which treat, uh, teaches glass blowing uh, to young people, economically uh, disadvantaged youth. And we had um, these custom votives made in the rotary colors, blue and yellow. And uh, we will uh, send you one. We, we like to think that it's a reminder uh, of how service ignites our souls. So please accept it as a token of our appreciation for, uh, for your time and for sharing. And um, uh, I'm, I'm sure that if uh, people have questions uh, that they can reach out to you and, and uh, uh, answer those questions. But thank you very much and thank you for all you do in Chicago. We at Rotary obviously appreciate collaborations and you obviously have done a wonderful job of in, engaging uh, the community. So thank you very much. Well, it was my pleasure to join you all. I think our missions have so much overlap. The others about connecting people to each other under the sky we all share um, in service of a better world. And so uh, I think, yeah, thanks. Thanks for all that you're doing. And it was a pleasure to join you. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> now is the time in our meeting when during this, these challenging times, we've elicited people to share uh, something that was joyful in your life or uh, is of concern. We found that people in these times of isolation really uh, enjoy um, kind of sharing uh, with others. So if uh, there's anyone in the crowd who would like to, to talk, just unmute yourself and, uh, and uh, jump in. I, I actually will start. Um, it's a very joyous weekend for me. We have three children and this weekend, one of them graduated from medical school and one of them graduated from college. And we had a wonderful weekend celebrating their success and um, looking forward to their future. Fortunately, they're both employed in these very difficult times. So it was a wonderful, a wonderful weekend for our family. But I welcome anyone else who'd like to share either joys or concerns. I would note that uh, we have a member um, who lost her uh, lost her son, and uh, our heart uh, our heart goes out to uh, goes out to her. So, anyone else? No takers today, huh? Anyone want to unmute? I guess not. Um, okay, then let's let's move on to uh, to our introductions. We like to spend time because we have. A lot of visitors and today we do have a lot of visiting Rotarians and uh, some international Rotarians. So um, given that we have a, a, a little bit smaller crowd, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I'll go through, uh, pardon me if I ask our members, uh, we have several new members, I think um, several who are on, on the call. Um, Marshall. Just could introduce yourself, go ahead. Marshall uh, Francisco Munoz. Can I, can I indulge uh, our, our uh, speaker in a question that I've been interested in? How can uh, she help knowing her, uh, her interest in uh, the big universe? How can she help us with contact tracing in this COVID era? It's a, it's a good question and something we've been um, working with a few different teams on Zooniverse to see if our Zooniverse platform could be helpful in some way. Um, so far, the results have been that actually there, um, there are other existing platforms that the medical community is using for that that are better set up um, in terms of following those. Um, we have one project in development right now that's more in terms of the virus itself. Um, it's actually, if you go to, or I can even share, if you, if you don't mind me, um, we have a project called Bash the Bug that maybe I won't even show it, but we have 
in our list of medical projects in Zooniverse, one of the projects is Bash the Bug that looks at antibiotics uh, resistance to tuberculosis. And it's looking at um, petri dishes and samples of cells and seeing uh, a mix of 16 different antibiotics, which ones are most effective with which strain. That type of research that's like pure medical research that people are also doing around coronavirus, um, this Bash the Bug project around TB is informing those teams of techniques and models, as well as um, just general approaches and data sharing um, that are core to Zooniverse. Um, so those are the ways that we're trying to help specifically to this moment. Um, and then the other is just providing people a way to feel connected. Oh, thank you for po posting that link. Um, Bash the Bug is now in the chat. Um, it's also just to the worldwide community as we're all trying to connect meaningfully to one another. It's, it's just helpful having an online Fine. platform that's a supportive, welcoming, kind space where scientists and the public can engage with one another. So that's more on the sort of social emotional side, but we're also working with medical researchers to try to help directly. Thank you for the question. Yeah, so thank you so much for that question. And I think it highlights both the question and the answer that, you know, we really are all in this thing together and we have to come up with innovative ways to combat the virus and to, to help each other. And so um, uh, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? Okay, let's let's do some introductions. Um, I usually leave this up to people who want to introduce themselves. If you uh, would like to introduce yourself, if you could just state your name, uh, your uh, Rotary Club. I'd like to start with the Rotary members. Uh, your Rotary Club and um, how you found out about the meeting today. So, um, Rick. Uh, hi, Marshall. Yeah, I'm Rick Tanucci. I'm with the St. Louis Rotary Club, Club 11, not not quite Club One, but uh, I'm originally a Chicagoan, but ended up in St. Louis on a job transfer. The uh, the image behind me is my backyard in Florida, where we're kind of sheltered down here um, for the moment, but uh, I'm hoping to get back to St. Louis soon. Uh, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, I heard about it because I'm on your email list. Um, so uh, thanks for doing this. Yeah, well, you're welcome, and thank you, thank you for joining us today, um, uh, Valdemar. Hi, President Marshall. I, um, I'm the, I think it's the fourth time I, I take part. I'm very much appreciated, and um, warm greetings from a wonderful uh, sunny evening from Witten. Uh, I'm a member of Rot Rotary Witten. It's in Northern Westphalia uh, in, in Germany and we have a very, very nice weather uh, and waiting again for rain, of course. Thank you, Valdemar. It's great to have you and you're welcome any anytime. Uh, Dennis, I introduced you, but can, can you introduce yourself? Yes. Hello everyone. Uh, this is something new for me, a Zoom meeting, but I have such wonderful memories of Chicago. Last year I uh, came to Chicago to run the marathon and I went to the Friday dinner club and it was just wonderful hospitality. I uh, went to the Field Museum. Unfortunately, I missed the Adler Planetarium, but I have such wonderful memories of Chicago and uh, yes, yeah, great to be with you here tonight. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Marshall. And Dennis, you may be one of a, a, a small number who r ran the last Chicago Marathon for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to see whether it goes forward in October. But thank you so much for joining us. And, and we'll hear from you during the four-way test. Uh, Martha? Hi. This is Martha Herrera. I'm from the World Nations uh, Club here in Chicago. And I love joining this, this meetings. I've been, I registered once and now I've been getting um, all these notifications. So I make an, a big effort to join and I Thank enjoy. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining. Andreas, it looks like you lost your, your, young, uh, your young companion there. Can you introduce yourself? 
back. Oh, there's your okay, young Okay, we were together. I was just looking for the picture. Yeah, I'm Andreas. We, we enjoyed it with my little son who's five years old. And thank you so much for, for showing us. We, we had lunch in between, so I might have missed a little bit of the end. I'm sorry. Yeah. Where are you from, Andreas? Germany, originally. What? Are you a Rotarian? Yeah. What club? Yours now, Rotary One. That's where I entered. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, okay. Oh, but you're back now. You moved back. Yeah. Yeah. So great to see you. Thank you. It was a pleasure on my side. Um, uh, Steve? Can you introduce yourself, Steve? We may have lost Steve, Steve Diller from uh, the San Francisco Club. It looks like his computer's frozen. Um, let's see, who's next? Liz? Hi, how are you? Very good. My name is Liz Goggins. I'm a member of the Rotary Club of St. Croix Mid-Isle. I do apologize, it is kind of windy here uh, today. Um, it's great joining you guys. I've been enjoying uh, Zoom meetings for a while now. I hope it's great to get to meet so many people. And I did move my, my screen a little bit because I know that some people were putting up backgrounds, tropical backgrounds. Mine is the real thing. Uh, <laughs> it's a little uh, hazy today. We do have Sahara dust now in the, in the Caribbean. So it makes our days a little hazy, but they, the Sahara Dust holds down hurricanes, so we appreciate that. Yeah, how, uh, how is the pandemic affecting you there? You're obviously very dependent on tourism. Is it really just the natives? Uh, well, you know, we're, we're very small. There's only between uh, the four islands, St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. John, Water Island. We have a population of about, right now it's about 105,000 people. Um, most of the people who have contracted um, COVID-19, it has come from people coming into the territory. Um, right now, the, the total number in the territory is 69 cases. That's away from the disease. There are two or three Us is that we're so, you know, we're so far away from everything, and we're isolated, and they closed down, you know, the, well, they didn't close down, but there are no tourists coming in. The only people allowed to come in were uh, workers and uh, emergency personnel. So because the number of people traveling into the territory was cut, that helped stop the spread, but in the last two or three weeks, it's climbing. So, um, you know, we have, we have some concern here. Sure. So thank you very much and good, good luck to you. And when this ends, hopefully you can come to Chicago and visit us in person. I would enjoy that immensely. Yeah. Steve, can we try you again? Sure. Yeah, sorry. I, um, I had a connection problem. So I'm Steve Diller. I'm, uh, I'm a member of the San Francisco Club, so number two visiting number one. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, moving to right on the other side of Lake Michigan from Chicago at the end of June, a little town called Three Oaks in Michigan. And then probably spring of 2021, we're going to get a, an apartment in downtown Chicago. I'm originally from Chicago, and uh, so coming back after 25 years, so uh, uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to look around and see what the Rotarians are up to. Well, thank you for joining us and we hope to, to see you in person uh, soon. So safe see travels you. and good luck with the move. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, it looks like there are a couple people here. Seville, um, do you want to introduce yourself? No, I guess not. So um, is there anyone else that I missed who wants to introduce themselves? 
Okay, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we are continuing our Meals to the Frontline program. As many of you know, we're providing meals to uh, area hospitals in the medical district and uh, several hospitals on the north side, as well as the Essex House, where uh, several first responders from out of town are uh, living while they're in Chicago. A uh, $5 donation provides a nice uh, lunch or dinner for one of these uh, first responders. Our um, resident chef, uh, Alita, is uh, making these meals and they've been very well received. We're accepting um, donations and anyone who wants to uh, deliver meals uh, is welcome to do so. Just contact the office or give Alita or uh, Eric, um, Eric Kempel a call. Um, we're very proud to share with you the a project that was is was conceived of and is being implemented by our Interact Club, which is a group of high schoolers uh, at Northside Prep. They're uh, manufacturing masks uh, remotely, and uh, we're looking for volunteers who can transport supplies uh, between uh, our member, the Interact members' homes and then ultimately deliver them. They're going to be delivered to a local shelter. Uh, most of these kids don't drive yet, so we need uh, someone who can transport the, the materials. And again, you can contact the office uh, to volunteer. Um, uh, Eric has a special message. Eric Kempel has a special message for us uh, regarding the annual campaign. Given the pandemic, uh, the rules have changed a little. So Eric? Oh, yeah, thank you very much, Marshall. Um, so first of all, thank you to all who have given uh, since November for our annual campaign to both the Rotary International Foundation and our own Rotary One Foundation. It's very important and very vital to what we do. Uh, now, before I go off and ask for money, the first thing I wanna say is that first and foremost, I want you to make sure that you're okay First, I understand that in this crisis, we might not all be doing uh, well, depending on what, what field you're, you're in. So you need to make sure that, that you're secure uh, first. But, but if you're weathering all of this uh, all right, um, I do wanna make sure that before we get to the end of June that you've been able to make your contribution to the Rotary One Foundation. We are, you know, because of this disruption, <clears throat> we are uh, short um, of our goal. Uh, by a bit, um, both monetarily and getting our, you know, to, to the closest extent possible, our 100% uh, participation, even if it's, uh, you know, five bucks that, that you can provide. And the reason why donating to the foundation is important before the end of the year um, is because the, the money that we collect this year goes into the foundation corpus, and then it determines in future years what we're able to spend on our service projects, local and international. And I think we all can see that the fallout from COVID-19 is going to be pretty vast and pretty big. And so if we come in short now, then in the future years, ironically, when the community needs our help the most, we're gonna be least able to provide that. So I really ask that um, you connect with Cam, with Karen, with Ed, me, Marshall, any of us, we can help get you connected um, so that you can make uh, that donation so that we can continue to provide the services, the important services that uh, are needed by our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, uh, the club committees are continuing to meet. The, one benefit of Zoom is that we have more flexibility when those committees meet. So you can look at the club calendar, uh, go to our website. If you have questions, you can call the office and uh, determine when the uh, committee meetings uh, are going forward. Uh, we have a, the annual meeting of the district is at the end of the month. Again, Zoom enables us all to participate, which is unusual uh, given that the meeting is usually in person. You're all welcome. Uh, to come. The district uh, website has the information. And again, you can call the office or contact me. Uh, please save the date. We're looking to do our Woman of the Year celebration on September 22nd. Hopefully that's far enough out in the future that that will take place in person. 
it's a good goal to look forward to to celebrate the women in our community uh, in one of the uh, what may be one of the uh, first in-person meetings that we have. So please, uh, please save, save that date. Uh, on Tuesday, May 26th, uh, we have the district governor's uh, visit. Uh, Debbie Ross will be visiting us to tell us what's happening in the district and the uh, talk about the impact that the pandemic has had on uh, operations of the, the Rotary District. Uh, next week, um, we want to have uh, what is going to be a very special club assembly. Uh, Eric and I, in talking about our programming uh, for the rest of this year, uh, realized that we, we really need a time when the membership can uh, get together and talk about, um, you know, how we've been doing during the pandemic. Uh, we have been very blessed with a series of uh, interesting and, and engaging speakers who have taken the time uh, to meet with us and we, we very much appreciate that and the participation has been fantastic. Um, we felt that it was important that we have a meeting dedicated to talking about where the club is, what the club's future is in, in light of uh, everything that's going on and all the uncertainty. We want to provide a forum for people to share their thoughts about how we come out of this uh, time of, of isolation, how we learn, uh, how we take the lessons that we've learned and make the club better and stronger and better prepared to deal with challenges in the future. So I encourage everyone here to, to come. Uh, everyone's welcome, but I would particularly like to see as many members as possible because um, you know, it's your club and it's very important that we, we not uh, take for granted uh, what we've learned and not take for granted what we had before all this happened and find a way to uh, bring back all of the good things that we lost because of the pandemic and add to those things that we've, uh, the things that we've learned during the pandemic. So. I encourage everyone to come. It will be at the same time. We'll convene the meeting at 1210. Uh, with that, uh, I invite um, Dennis to unmute. Uh, everyone else should stay muted. Um, and we'd like to have Dennis uh, lead us uh, in the four-way test. So feel free to uh, recite the test even though you're on mute. Dennis? Thank you very much, Marshall, and uh, thank you very much, of course, to Dr. Laura for a fa fascinating talk. The four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Dennis, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Meeting adjourned.